ravaging the East since 1937 and Japan's invasion of China, reached Europe on the 1st of September 1939 with Germany's invasion of Poland. It became global on the 7th of December 1941 when Japanese aircraft attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. It touched every continent and lasted for six years. It ended with a new weapon for a new age. This is the history of the greatest of all man-made events. These men are part of that history. They are eyewitnesses to the triumphs and tragedies of the war wherever it was fought. Their testimony is part of the story of how our world was made. By those who could pay, and those who could no longer meet. The price of empire. Whatever justifications for their actions were advanced then or have been advanced since, the facts cannot be disputed. War that consumed the world was started by German and Japanese acts of aggression. And now it is 1944. Germany and Japan are being driven from the lands that they have conquered. They face a desperate defense of their own territory and the prospect of unconditional surrender. Late in 1944, the winter had stopped the Allied advance north through Italy, short of Bologna. With spring, the offensive would be resumed. All of a sudden, these Germans were flying over us, dropping pamphlets. Hemp Mountain Division, welcome. You will be all killed. You will never come back alive to your country. What's the scare into you? Mark Clark's 15th Army Group, comprising the 5th US and 8th British Armies, would drive the Germans into the mountains. Italy was the costliest campaign waged by Anglo-American forces against Germany. I remember this German bunker that must have been hit with an artillery shell. And this German was yelling for help. One of the guys was going with a grenade. He pulls a pin and throws it right in there. Boom. And everything was quiet. I tried to stop him, you know, but maybe he was, in a way, he was right. Mark Clark planned to catch and squeeze German Army Group C between his two armies. By now, Italians, in the form of partisan brigades, were fighting with the Allies. Replacements for Canadian troops that had been withdrawn to join the Normandy invasion force. The campaign began with Indians and New Zealanders attacking on the 9th of April, followed by other 8th Army units attempting to turn the flank of the German 10th Army. Good progress made and many prisoners taken by men who, though crowded out of the headlines, are most certainly not a forgotten army. The U.S. 5th Army General Truscott was delayed by bad weather and joined the offensive on April 14th. In the center, 2nd Polish Corps crossed the Silaro and began forging ahead along Route 9. 
Bologna fell on the 21st. Modena and Ferrara in the next couple of days. On the 23rd, General von Weitinghoff, who had been encouraged to make peace overtures by Heinrich Himmler himself, agreed that an approach should be made to the Allies without reference to Berlin. But by the time an Allied representative had received authorization to negotiate, the offensive had an almost unstoppable momentum. The Americans reached Genoa on April the 27th. On the 29th, the Germans, acting without authorization from Berlin, signed an unconditional surrender. The war in Italy was over. That was that, unconditional surrender of nearly a million men signed away by German officers in sports coats. On the same day, but on the other side of the world, the formation that was longer in frontline service than any other in the British Army, the 17th Indian Division, entered Pegu as part of the final assault on Burma's capital. Rangoon. Two operations designed to expel the Japanese from Burma had been underway for several months. Capital, in which Slim's 14th Army advanced from Assam across the Chindwin, re-establishing contact with the nationalist Chinese, and Dracula, a combined airborne, land and amphibious assault on Rangoon. Operation Capital had been launched on December 3rd. General Kimura, commanding Japan's Burma Area Army, was in a threadbare situation with little prospect of resupply. Obliged to marshal what he had with great care, he fell back before the initial advance offering token resistance. This lack of stubborn defense encouraged Slim to change the plan. Operation Extended Capital was more ambitious. It envisaged a race south to seize a port, Mulmain or Rangoon, before the onset of the monsoon. By mid-January, the 19th Indian Division had established a bridgehead across the Irrawaddy. At the end of the month, the Burma and Lido roads were joined at Mongyu, the Chinese First Army now striking south along the Burma Road, the 6th making for Bamo southeast. Fourth Corps pressed south, initiating the battle for Mektila, which fell to the 17th Indian Division, whose supply route was cut by a Japanese counterattack. The veteran 17th had to rely on airdropped supplies, repelling repeated attempts by the Japanese 33rd Army to take Mektila's airfields. The 33rd's commander, General Masiki Hinda, was forced to order a withdrawal on March 28th, by which time Mandalay had fallen. で、あの、それで捕まってね。で、一連だと言ってね。で、お前ここ入れちゃって。土地ろうですわな。3 by late April, the first promise of the monsoon, the so-called mango rains, were falling. It was decided to go ahead 
with the combined Allied assault on Rangoon. When we got near Rangoon, the rains came. You can't believe it, but within one night, the fields were full of water and the tree top was visible. Otherwise, uh, the trunk was not there. So you couldn't move. The Gurkha Parachute Battalion dropped onto Elephant Point on May 1st. The 26th Indian Division made the amphibious assault the next day, but there was nothing to assault. The Japanese had withdrawn the day before. The Japs apparently used to go for this gold teeth. Used to have gold teeth, a lot of them. You come across dead Japs, you had to search them. See what identification on them, tell who they were. And the chap that we had in the West Kents, he used to look at them and collect their teeth. He got a little bag, gold teeth. Now this is true, I'm not making this up. By the beginning of August, the last Japanese had withdrawn from Burma, but they were not pursued. Because by August 1945, Allied troops were on Japanese soil. The opening campaign of 1945, pushing back the co-prosperity sphere, had been the conquest of the Philippines. It had started with Leyte, then moved to the main island of Luzon, where the first landings had occurred at the beginning of January. The landings were virtually unopposed, but offshore, the activity was destructive. Kamikaze was an effective use of obsolete machines and only partially trained pilots. The Japanese dispatched waves of kamikaze, which damaged many ships. The kamikaze slogan was, one plane, one warship. They did not prevent the 6th Army General Walter Kruger from establishing itself in the north of Luzon. 14th Corps struck Lingayen, 1st Corps alongside it struck Rosario and met fierce resistance before breaking out. 11th Corps landed north of Bataan on January 29th, 11th Airborne at the entrance to Manila Bay two days later. In Tokyo, Prime Minister Koiso admitted to the parliament that Military developments are in a state which does not necessarily admit of optimism. 14th Corps reached the outskirts of Manila on February 3rd and General Douglas MacArthur announced that the capital had fallen. He was wrong. Japanese resistance in Manila did not end until March 3rd by which time Kruger's 6th Army had taken 6,500 casualties and the Filipino capital had been reduced to rubble. An estimated 100,000 Filipinos were killed. The Japanese could hardly doubt their fate and vengefully took a terrible toll on the civilian population in a criminal terror for which their overall commander, the storied Tiger of Malaya, would be held responsible. We say that if Yamashita is responsible in any measure for the violations of the laws of war committed by the men under his command in the Philippines, anything less than the death sentence would be a mockery. General Tomoyuki Yamashita was hanged for war crimes. Many Japanese troops remained in strong defensive positions throughout the Philippines. They were effectively ignored. 
Impotent players in a war that had moved on to storm the two fortified outposts that now stood between the Allies and the Japanese home islands. Iwo Jima and Okinawa. More than 1,200 kilometers south of Tokyo, one of the volcano group of islands, Iwo Jima, has an area of just over 20 square kilometers. In early 1944, Major General Tadamichi Kuribayashi and the 21,000 men of the 109th Division had been sent to turn Iwo Jima into an impregnable fortress and to defend it. Kuribayashi was seen off by the Emperor in person. He was not expected to return to Japan. The Allies were now starting to transfer troops from Europe. On the morning of February the 19th, the first wave of the men of the 3rd, 4th and 5th Marine Divisions landed. The Japanese had a way of making underwater swimmers strap a bomb on their head, swim underwater, and bounce their head into the ship. And we had to stand over the rail with rifles to shoot them as they were coming towards the ship. Kuribayashi's plan was to hold fire until the beach was congested with Marines and all their equipment. Iwo Jima was a tough battle because of Mount Suribaki. They were bombarding it, but they weren't making any progress because of the tunnels that were dug there. The Japanese had prepared strong defensive positions, well-placed machine guns installed in bunkers, heavy artillery protected behind reinforced steel doors firing from the high ground. The Marines were ready for suicide banzai attacks, but these did not come. Kuribayashi, who believed them to be wasteful, had forbidden them. As the battle ground on, the Japanese grew short of food, water, and ammunition. On February 23rd, Marines reached the top of Mount Suribachi and six of them hoisted the flag. Three did not survive the battle. The loss of Suribachi was not the end of the fight. Japanese positions held out in the north of Iwo Jima and only relentless marine pressure, air support, use of flamethrowers and weight of numbers carried the day. In the end, the Japanese did resort to the Banzai charge finally closing the battle for Iwo Jima on March 25th. Taking the island had cost the Americans 6,800 US dead, more than a third of the Marine Corps dead for the whole war. 216 Japanese had been captured from a garrison of 22,000. The others were killed in battle, committed suicide, or hid in the caves from which they were painstakingly prized in the years ahead, the last surrendering in 1949. The Allies strengthened their force as they moved towards a more substantial challenge, Okinawa, a last stepping stone to the invasion proper. Whilst Americans prepared to invade Japanese soil, on Europe's eastern front, their allies had been established on enemy soil since January. At the turn of 44-5, the Soviets deployed 6.7 million troops from the Baltic to the Adriatic, twice the number that Germany had unleashed with Barbarossa. A third of all Soviet infantry and half of its tank park was concentrated on two fronts, 
under Konev and Zhukov astride the road to Berlin and ready for the assault. Konev's offensive opened on 12th January. The Soviets unleashed 200 divisions across the Vistula against the ruins of Army Group Center. By the end of the first day, tanks had broken the front to a penetration of more than 30 kilometers. The next day, 3rd Belorussian Front Cheryakovsky moved. On the 14th, 1st Belorussian Front Zhukov advanced with 2nd Belorussian Front Rokossovsky alongside him. Two days later, German troops garrisoning Warsaw began to withdraw. Warsaw fell on the 17th, Krakow on the 18th. In two weeks, the Soviet army would advance 480 kilometers the Germans falling back until the advance paused with the Russians 80 kilometers from the suburbs of Berlin. On January the 20th, elements of Konev's first Ukrainian front crossed the German border at Namslau. Their north, the 5th Tank and 5th Guards armies were making a dash for the Oder. On January 21st, Hitler created a new army group, Vistula and gave command of it to Heinrich Himmler. The army group could boast virtually no soldiers, only Volkssturm, people's militia. So the fact that Himmler was not a soldier hardly mattered. As they advanced, the Red Army liberated monuments to the philosophy of those who had occupied their country. By the time they liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau on January 27th, the Red Army had already overrun the death camps at Treblinka, Majdanek, Sobibor, and Belzec. I hoped against hope that when we arrived to Auschwitz, I will be able to help my mother. How wrong I was. So in front of Dr. Mengele, he, did, he was then the, the main selector of who should live and who should die. He conducted this button. He wore white gloves. He was immaculate in his uh, assess, uh, 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 uniform, shiny high boots. On liberating Auschwitz-Birkenau, Soviet troops found 368,820 men's suits, 836,255 ladies' coats and dresses, and seven tons of human hair. A friend of mine that was the first one to get to Dachau, he looked at me, he was trying to talk to me, he bust out crying, he hugged me. He said, I can't tell you about it. He says, that's how sad it was. Two million Germans fled from the invader. Hitler's Drang nach Osten, thrust to the east, had become Flucht aus dem Osten, flight from the east reversing the effects of 800 years of German settlement. Мы приходили в село, где ни одного человека не было. Мы приходили в города, где тоже пустые города. Немцы убегали, боясь, боясь, а их пугала пропаганда немецкая, что Красная Армия придет и будет мстить. 
за те злодеяния, которые они совершали на территории Советского Союза. Вот в этом городе мы остановились со штабом вместе с четвертым корпусом. И часть его в земле. И вдруг мы слышим детский плач. Ну, скорее открыли крышку. И что мы видим? Мать задушила одну свою девочку. А другую пыталась задушить, но мы, конечно, их освободили, не дали. Всех оставшихся в живых, еще две девочки и эту мать, завели в свой штаб, дали успокоиться, накормили. И потом эта женщина горько сожалела. By the beginning of February, Zhukovs and Konev's fronts were both poised on the line of the Oda, ready for the final assault. By mid-February, 8.35 million refugees were hastening away from the advancing Red Army. Some managed to board ship at Baltic ports to make good their escape. Thousands boarded the Wilhelm Gustloff out of Danzig. It was sunk by a Russian submarine on January 30th with the loss of at least eight and possibly 9,000 lives, the greatest maritime disaster in history. The day before the sinking of the Wilhelm Gustloff, Zhukov's first Belarusian front had crossed the German border. Konev was to his south and both were bracing for the race to Berlin. But both fronts had advanced further and faster than anticipated and were outstripping their supply and support. They had to pause. In early February, Chernyakovsky, Rokossovsky and Bagramian began their assaults and south of the line, Budapest fell to the Red Army. The siege of Budapest had lasted for 50 days, from when Soviet forces first encircled the city on December 26, 1944, trapping 70,000 German and Hungarian soldiers and over 800,000 civilians. Самая продолжительная и самая напряженная. Много Погибло там наших. В том числе и меня сбили там. Открыл стрельбу ведущий мистер Шмидт. Отвалил, но меня сбил ведом. Он зажег самолет. И когда я вывел искажение, мне ударило в лицо. Из-под кормы. Ну хорошо, что я был в кожаных перчатках. Я лицо закрыл перчатками. Потом одну ладонь открыл, то есть оставил, второй открыл. Я уже на порушитель, на порушитель начал скользить, чтобы побыстрее к земле. И тут у меня мысль такая возникла. Перед войной э, у нас э, пользовался большой популярностью фильм э, «Большой вальс» о Штраусе. «Голубай Дунай». И вот у нас было от «Голубой Дунай», хоть бы глазом увидеть. Ну, думаю, вот так. Я мечтал увидеть, а лечу в него. И никакой он не голубой, а свинцового цвета. As their defenses collapsed, militia from Hungary's fascist Arrow Cross Party murdered up to 15,000 Jews. But thousands more, who had been protected by Sweden's special envoy, survived. 
The envoy, detained by Soviet forces on January 17th, disappeared. His name was Raoul Wallenberg. The date when Budapest fell, February the 13th, is also remembered for a British action on that day, an action which the British argued was an attempt to help their Russian allies. On the night of the 13th, 14th February, in Operation Onslaught, 796 Lancasters of RAF Bomber Command hit Dresden, a city close to the Soviet line of advance. Much of the ancient city was destroyed. 50,000 people were killed. Our own crews reported that on their way home, Dresden's fires were clearly visible from over a hundred miles away. Disquiet over the destruction is not a post-war phenomenon. Churchill himself was disturbed by an action which did not speed the end of the war. But neither, its supporters would argue, did it delay Germany's collapse. Ten days after Dresden, Rokossovsky launched his front into Pomerania. Zhukov joined the offensive on March 1st, and four days later, the German counteroffensive, Spring Awakening, was launched at the third Ukrainian front, General Tolbukhin. In four days, the Germans advanced 25 kilometers, but were soon turned back. By mid-March, Spring Awakening was finished, and Hitler indulged in another round of sackings and replacements. By the 6th of April, Malinowski and Tolbukhin had reached the outskirts of Vienna. The formerly glamorous capital of a great empire fell on the 13th. remained was the battle for Berlin. So sure were the Allies of victory that the Yalta Conference was organized for February. Two months after attending the conference, President Roosevelt was dead of a cerebral hemorrhage. He was 63. All Washington said their last farewell to the man who had led them for so long with such wisdom and so great a sympathy. On the day that Dwight D. Eisenhower, who would in the years ahead succeed to the presidency of the United States of America, assumed supreme command of Allied ground troops in Europe, the European situation appeared to be wholly favorable. American Third Army General Patton was advancing on Metz, the First Army, General Hodges was moving towards Cambrai, and the British Second, Dempsey, entered Arras. South Patches US 7th, along with the French Army B, was closing on Lyon, which was taken on the day that the British Guards Armoured Division liberated the Belgian capital, Brussels. General Montgomery had a plan for an action that would speed victory. Eisenhower offered him the use of the reserve force. The plan was called Market Garden. Its intention was to turn the German flank on the Rhine, seize bridges across that river, and so facilitate and expedite the advance. On September the 17th, Market Garden was launched. Market was the airborne operation to seize the bridges. Garden was the overland advance by 30th Corps General Horrocks to link up with the paratroops. It required, if all went well, the airborne troops to hold out for four days until the arrival of 30th Corps. All did not go well.
many books have been written and films made about the bridge too far. And the arguments are still pressed about what went wrong and why. Montgomery identified the chief problem as having been the weather. Always a reliable excuse. The terrain proved difficult for and slowed the advance of 30th Corps. Most of the airborne forces, for a variety of not particularly convincing reasons, were dropped away from rather than on or at least adjacent to the bridges they were designated to take. At Arnhem, they were dropped between 8 and 12 kilometers away, almost on the heads of panzer divisions that were re-equipping. We were over the DZ, and it was red on, stand up, hook up, uh, green on, go, and out we went. Feet together, head down, shoulders round, feet together, watch the ground, bump, and that was it. US 101st Airborne achieved its objectives with little resistance and did link with 30th Corps, as did 82nd Airborne. The bridges at Eindhoven and Nijmegen were taken. On the 21st of September, reinforced German formations recaptured the bridge at Arnhem, held by the British 1st Airborne Division. I and what was left of my troop. We went in there on Sunday and fought from there until Wednesday afternoon. And there weren't many of us left then. Ammunition was pretty well non-existent by then. On September 26th, the first airborne was encircled. Only 2,000 of its 10,000 members escaped across the Rhine. Uh, and I think about 148 dropped, and there were 10 of us left. The failure of the operation meant that the war in Europe could not end in 1944. The day after the loss of 1st Airborne, Montgomery turned his attention to what some thought should have been his first priority. Clearing the Scheldt estuary. The prize, vital to the Allied advance, was access to and use of Antwerp. The large-scale port that the Allies needed pump supplies and reinforcements into their ever-extending line. Antwerp could not be used until the Scheldt estuary had been cleared and, sitting like a roadblock in the middle of the estuary, was the island of Valkeren. The Canadian 1st Army began to move on the north bank of the Scheldt. The British 2nd Army was moving from the southeast. On October 16th, the Canadian 2nd Division took Wernstrecht. German 15th Army General Gustav von Sanger was now trapped. They dropped down behind the sand dunes and the shells would come down, and so we all got smacked. I just remember spinning around and uh, hitting the sand and, and shouting something like, uh, take cover, <laughs> to, to, the, to the lads. And where did they go? They ran into the German pillboxes, didn't they? With the Germans. <laughs> Not the ones who fired at us, but the ones who were just about to give up. <laughs> The Canadians crossed onto Valkyren on the 3rd of November and the island was secured by the 8th. 
the day that Patton began his offensive in the Saar. The French First Army moved on the Belfort Gap. By the middle of the month, there were formations in motion all along the line. The American First and Ninth Armies to the north of Patton, elements of the 7th entering Strasbourg on the 2nd and the 6th entering the Maginot Line on the day that the first vessels entered and started to use the port of Antwerp. And then, all hell broke loose. Operation Herbstnabel Autumn Mist was unleashed in the Ardennes on December the 16th, 1944. History remembers it as the Battle of the Bulge. The 145 kilometer front was held by four American divisions, with one inexperienced armored division, the 9th, in support. Two of the infantry divisions had been sent to the quiet Ardennes to recuperate, and a third, the 106th, had never been in action. It was onto this force that two panzer armies fell. The German 5th Army broke through the 106th Division. Battle-hardened 28th offered stiffer resistance. It was late in the afternoon before Allied High Command properly realized what was happening. Partly due to the confusion sown by 150 Germans who, dressed as Americans, had infiltrated Allied lines under the command of Otto Skorzeny the man who had rescued Mussolini. Our command was taken totally by surprise. So they reacted uh, in an extreme. Everything that could fly flew to bomb their supply train. I mean, any airplane they could get in the air went. And I can remember seeing the sky just filled with airplanes. It was really quite a sight. On the 18th, Eisenhower halted the advance on the Rhine, giving priority to defeating the German offensive. German onslaught slowed. Fuel was becoming a problem. When the bulbs broke, they rushed us up to Belgian and try to get there to help out. There was three of us in a house trying to get some sleep. And as we were there, a bomb came through and shrapnel was going all over the place. I got hit in the leg twice, and the other fellow, there was another fellow got hit in the chest. And it was the third guy, we didn't know what happened to him. There wasn't a mark on him. So we just assumed he died from concussion. Our outfit was in the Battle of the Bulge. We were around Bastogne. We were in a farmhouse. And I was laying next to a buddy of mine. And all of a sudden, we hear this whoosh, thud. And it went right between us. We bought it like that. It was an 88. But it didn't go off. So I looked over at him and I said, holy snow. He said, I just did. On the 21st, the commander of the US 101st Airborne in Bastogne, which had been surrounded, received a formal demand from the German commander that his troops surrender. General Antony McAuliffe's one-word formal response was too difficult for German interpreters, but priceless for history. Nuts, he wrote. By the 22nd, 6th Panzer Army had stopped altogether. Units were losing contact with each other. 
Von Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army, which had surrounded Bastogne, was pushing forward. But that is as far as the Germans got. The 3rd US Army under Patton now brought pressure from the south and with the weather clearing, the overwhelming Allied air supremacy started to tell. The 3rd Army was General Patton. And I remember during the period where we were under his command, he was very big with uh, tanks and armored forces. We as infantry, keeping up with uh, those tanks, uh, well, we were running our tails off. The Ardennes offensive cost each side about 80,000 casualties, losses from which the Allies could recover. But not the Axis, which was even more the case with losses in armor and artillery and aircraft. In the first two months of 1945, the United States landed seven full-strength divisions in Europe. Three of them armored. It took 45 ships to move a single armored division across the Atlantic. The scale of the operation comes into focus. The bulge had held up the Allied push across the Rhine for six weeks, but it had only been held up. Crossing the Rhine was the last barrier before Eisenhower's armies poured into the fatherland. We were going to be the thrust into mainland Germany. And all we knew was Germany was across the river, and we all piddled in the river for good luck. Patton crossed the Rhine at Oppenheim the next night, Montgomery crossed at Emmerich. And then the US Third Army, and then the Seventh, and on the last day of March, the French First Army at Germersheim. In less than four weeks, Russian and American and British troops would join hands on the Elbe. The war in Europe that had started 68 months earlier was almost over. In the final episode of The Price of Empire, Berlin falls, the German Empire falls, and the war in the West ends. Allied forces fight their way onto Japanese soil, and a terrible new weapon hastens the end of the war in the East. Peace is made, the cost is counted, and the world is a different place. <laughs> 